I'll never forget walking into Albrook Airport just outside of Panama City for the first time. With falling scaffolding barely hidden behind tarp screens and propeller airplanes that still to this day I just don't quite trust, it was clear that the airport was under construction, which was fitting because so is my life. An expat by the age of 21, having lived on three different continents by 25, and now at 33, having traveled to over 30 different countries, I've followed damn near all the roads less traveled. And on this day in 2012, it led me to Panama. But I wasn't alone. I was there with 16 strangers, strangers who'd given me their money on the internet and hoped I didn't run off with it. Fair enough. Strangers who only had this new Facebook group about travel that I'd created in common up until that point. Yet there we were, and here we are. Tribes, historically defined as a social division in a traditional society consisting of families or communities linked by social, economic, religious, or blood ties, with a common culture and dialect typically having a recognized leader. Nomadness travel tribe, as shown and defined in 2017, the very first international group created specifically for millennial travelers of color, a group of nearly 20,000 primarily black women breaking the stereotypes set before us as to who we are, thus self-defining where we can go, were the catalyst for an entire travel lifestyle movement that's gone underrepresented by mass media and the travel industry as a whole. But we come from a grossly underrepresented history, and many could argue a grossly underrepresented present as well. See, our story is a complex one, starting with Victor Hugo Green. From 1936 to 66, a black mailman from right here in New York City created an annual guidebook for African-American road trippers, the Negro Motorist Green Book. See, on one hand, you had the rise of the black middle class, right? And on the other end, you had a country that was riddled in Jim Crow laws, pretty much prescribing discrimination to anyone who wasn't white. Separate but equal was more like separate and not. And this book outlined safe spaces for these travelers to stop for food, lodging, and car repairs along their route. It even noted sundown towns, or all-white neighborhoods where blacks had to leave by sundown or be met with police force, violence, or even death. The Green Book saved lives. It was indeed a black traveler's safe space. And this publication even led Green to go on and found his own traveling agency, thus creating the framework for generations of black American travelers after him. Then we have the James Baldwins, Nina Simones, and Josephine Bakers, all the way to the black soldiers who fought in world wars as our representations of the expats of that era. They're also some of the most distinguished representations of our culture, black culture. Now, black American culture is exported around the world many times without giving acknowledgement to the people it originated from. Our style, our music, our art, hell, even our struggles at times have been appropriated, diluted, and disconnected from us. So riddle me this, how can black American culture freely move around the world, but we as a people have parts of our history where physically we couldn't do the same? because there's a silent burden that every black American traveler takes with them abroad. That is the realization that when we go abroad, we are immediately either perpetuating or diffusing bias placed on us by negative media depictions that our country has ushered out to the rest of the world. So it's not them, it's what they've seen of us. Because if your itinerary says that you land in Japan on June 6, best believe that the images of the likes of you arrived on an earlier flight. I can no longer count how many times I've traveled abroad and people have thought that I was everything except for American, some even refusing to believe it after being corrected. And although those exchanges tend to be frustrating, they've created an actual opportunity that nomadness has taken on as responsibility. These trips are our moments to set the record straight. We're showing the world that black people do travel everywhere and we aren't a monolithic people. We come in all shades and sizes and with interests that are as diverse as we are. Our simply showing up allows the world to hear our stories from our mouths. By being exposed to us, we are able to unwrap our truths and gift them over and over and over again. Every trip, every conversation. We've expanded beyond sundown towns. 
I can now freely backpack in this country and walk into restaurants that my grandmother could have lost her life in decades ago because of the color of her skin. This is what the black travel movement means to its participants. From generations, we've gone from literally being chained to literally being able to fly with quite a bit of turbulence in between. Bred from nomadness, there are a number of communities for travelers of color today. Collectively, we are changing the perception of millions, both home and abroad. We are in India, celebrating Holy Festival of Colors in the streets of Jaipur, shark diving in Cape Town, South Africa, teaching English in Niigata, Japan, and yes, we are even running with the bulls at the San Fermin Festival in Pamplona, Spain. We are here and we are relevant. We are tribe. So, what's next? Well, I'm still here, holding the baton, still running, maybe just in heels. <laughs> But 30 trips later, December 2016, we ended up back in Panama. Once again at Albrook Airport, yet again on our way to Bocas del Toro. But the conversation has changed. It's not just about traveling. It's about developing, rooting. And we look forward to being the vessel to help take the movement to the next level. Time to get back to work. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.